This is Thorne's YouTube channel. Make sure you're tuning in, hit and subscribe. Right, I'm here for another episode of Reflections, and my guest for this one is going to be Freya, aka Freya Spears, but we just call her Freya, obviously. Here's why I actually would like to start the interview, Freya, which is, I've seen some of the other interviews you do, but they always ask where, like, you, like, either, like, got interested in Counter-Strike, or you, like, what, what your first job was, and then you tell, like, that similar story that people have heard before. But what I wanted to actually ask initially is this. I've noticed that a lot of people who I've met who are women who are interested in esports or sports i feel like there's a connection are often people where they maybe come from a family background where the family all follows a football team or some specific thing is there anything like that in your background is there a reason why like esports particularly grabbed you did you have any kind of like a sporting background in any sense um somewhat i was a competitive swimmer for uh, up until i was maybe 14 15 and then you kind of have that choice of you have to commit to this and that is going to be your life like you're going to become a professional you're going to try and make it to the olympics um or you want to get a bit of a social life and actually see some other shit outside of your sport um so that was kind of the decision point i had to make um and i decided to go with the latter um where i decided to teach swimming um, so I would still be training and stuff, but it wasn't for any kind of goal of getting into sort of competitions and, you know, uh, leveling up and getting into kind of a, a professional field. Um, and my parents were su super supportive, um, but probably the most chill parents of all the parents oh, okay. at those kind of swimming galas. Um, Is they, it like you'd imagine? Are most you know? of the other parents like the hyper competitive ones pushing you and stuff like that? exactly insanity right. and it made the kids that were kind of um you know uh, had the parents like that somewhat resent the sport sure and i think it was really nice that my parents didn't do that and they were like you know as soon as you don't want to do it anymore we're totally fine with it as long as you keep fit and healthy and you're happy and you've got some friends which is obviously you know swimming ticks all those boxes um we're we're happy for you to do whatever um so it kind of made sense to earn some money off of it by teaching um you know wider my horizons and then actually get a bit of a social life outside of of just swimming uh which ended up being kind of falling into video games which is kind of a, a, a very different world but uh similar vibes of the kind of social aspect of it particularly then because it was uh i was playing mostly xbox because my dad uh we used to play like a call of duty like spec ops together when you used right. to go do split screen yeah um which isn't a thing anymore it's really weird you just have to play online if you sure. go back to a console, right? So you, all your friends will need a console. You can't just come around somebody's house and have a game in session where you've got the sort of four splits of the screen and you have to put the cardboard boxes so no one's like screen watching. Um, which, yeah, that was like something we did um, a lot together. Um, and then, but I think one thing that was um, hopefully not so prevalent in generations now, but when I was, um, you know, uh, 14, 15, 13, um, it was seen as quite a boy thing which sure. to play games. So actually doing it on a social level, I didn't really have anybody to do it with because most of my friends were girls and they weren't really into that stuff. And there was a bit of a, I don't want to say like a stereotype, but there was like a slight stigma around, oh, girls playing video games, you just want attention from guys. Like it didn't sure. seem like a genuine right. thing that, that people wanted to do. So I was just like, you know what, I'm happy just going home and when my dad's finished work, we'll hop on together and just play some COD for a couple hours and um, play some Halo as well. Obviously Xbox was kind of leaning into that. Um, and then sort of accidentally found a group at school, which were mostly guys who um, were sort of transitioning from Xbox into PC. And that's when kind of stumbled across Counter-Strike was um, everybody was looking for a game that was more competitive than COD. Cause at that point it was when like Black Ops 1, um, Black Ops 2 were kind of a thing, like Modern Warfare uh, 2. Um, and because the game was changing every year, it didn't people really thought it got a bit watered down, right, or something, right? Exactly. Yeah, don't yeah. people say um, that? Isn't it like Black Ops supposedly like one of the best ones ever, and a lot of people think it was like downhill after there or something, right? Exactly. Yeah, Black Ops one. Like, don't bother playing anything after right. that. In my opinion, it was it was not good. It got kind of too modern, and it right. was all about the kill streaks and all the sort oh, of extra right, perks sure. and stuff. Yeah, which is where Counter Strike is so beautiful, and it's kind of uh, simplicity in that area. Um, it really is just about learning to shoot really well. And yes. you know that you're not going to receive 10 million updates in a week <laughs> sure. and everything's going to be different. And the game isn't going to change every year as well, which was kind of weird to see a competitive scene. Like, it, it's kind of just very different to yeah, CS, yeah. right? Um, so, yeah, I just kind of stumbled across it through that. I was kind of just meeting people and chatting to people and stuff. But, yeah, this, I think the the sports thing was 
an interesting um I've never been asked that question before um because there is quite I think people see it as being quite a big difference between esports and conventional sports but I think there is a massive crossover I think sometimes people just associate gaming with being incredibly antisocial which esports is I would argue kind of the antithesis of that because it's all about the community element okay. of things what about this then? Another reason I want to ask that question is when I actually saw you do literally the face at L- major L- at London. And if people don't know, you hadn't done many events at all at this point in time. One of the things I actually was surprised by was you had a lot of poise on stage. Like if people don't know, like I've told this story before, sometimes even before major finals, I would look over on the analyst desk and see like my an- fellow analysts knees just shaking, you know, like the moment before you go live that like you get that adrenaline dump. Yeah, like, yeah. You, you didn't seem like you had that was, was doing things like swim meets and the press of compete do you think any of that helped you is there a reason why you just sort of you, you talked to it very easily you didn't seem like you got even when you did the winning moment like in his astralis they just won the major you you didn't even seem like you were sort of starstruck you, you kind of just held it together what was going on i think there's a mixture of um incredible excitement and i actually can't believe this is real so how is this real you know what i mean like just this the surprise element of it um and what's the worst that can happen kind of vibe like i never thought i would be at this moment in my entire life like a couple months ago i was just sitting at home watching um and then moving into a realm where i'm actually given those opportunities like as much as i can feel in myself that okay maybe i'm not super qualified to do this maybe i don't have the most experience somebody has seen something in me where they believe that i can do it right so i want to prove them right and I also just want to bask in this moment because uh, for, for all I know, this could be the only opportunity I ever get. Right. So let's just try and nail it. Um, and I think there was definitely nerves in my head and there's all the, um, you know, possibilities of things going wrong and tech issues and all those sort of things. But in a weird way, I think my naivety of just having never really experienced those before, because I'd only right. done ECS prior and then the minors, I wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't concerned about that because, I mean, if it did, then it, then it does, right? I can't control that element of the show. I can just try and do my best. So I think it was kind of the mixture of, uh, yeah, the this seems unbelievable and just the pure excitement of this might be my one shot. Like, let's just try and nail it. And I'm glad that it came across as not seeming too nervous because i definitely definitely have like exactly like oh, you're sure. saying i think it's the moment when you're walking up on stage as well when it's such a unique viewpoint when you're coming around from behind the booths and you can see the team just having lifted the trophy and all the confetti going off around it and like phones flashing left right and center it's such a surreal viewpoint and it's only really you and the stage manager yes. that are experiencing that um which was so unique and i think at that moment i was like okay holy shit, this is actually real um, and I think it also helps um, just some, in terms of the nerves. Um, I don't know whether you've experienced this because obviously you've been on quite a vast array of desks, but a lot of the time, because the lights are pointed at you, you actually can't see you it. You don't really see the crowd in the you? crowd. No. Yeah, yeah. I can see kind of where the first row of people are, but it's not like you're looking out and the crowd are lit. Yes. You're the one that's lit, right? Yes. Um, so I think that's also really helpful in terms of like actually quelling sure. those nerves. Is you can kind of just pretend it's just you and the players and you can see the excitement with them. Um, not to say that it isn't kind of nerve wracking thinking about it, but um, yeah, yeah. I think there's kind of a load of mixture of things going on yeah. there where I didn't really feel the pressure because it was like, this is something I've always dreamed of and why not enjoy the moment rather than put too much, too much weight on it. Yes. No, no, I can relate to that. Like two things I would just say if someone's watching is one, almost everyone actually is nervous because nervous isn't about being scared. It's more like it's the feeling of like anything can happen, which is actually a good feeling. You sort of learn to, you know, embrace it. It's just that the skill is you just have a poker face. You just don't let people see. Like if people don't know half the time I'm delivering those cheeky jokes, like part of me's thinking like, just couldn't fucking go wrong, but I don't care. I'll give it off. I give off the vibe of like, just don't care. Do I? And then I agree with you. The other thing that's really useful to think about is the sort of notion that like, I'm here for a reason. I didn't just trip over and get on stage. Like, actually, I am here because I'm good and I'm good at what I'm going to do. So, actually, I'll figure it out. I'll, it'll work itself out, you know. So, along these lines, though, I have another question that no one ever asks. Like, I'm just going to say, if you're out there, by the way, just maybe do some research on Google. Just have a look up a few things because here's one thing I found out is I actually did see your original interviews. So I already had a sense of this. So I went back and I did some digging. And here's what no one knows about Freya is you were an envious stan 
You were actually a I fan was. girl of Envious in 2015, like the one with sharks and all those people. Right, go and hit me with it. You had the jersey and everything. I can't you believe were, you outed yeah. me. <laughs> you never told anyone that. <laughs> no, no. I think that's why I'm a bit like of a, you know, vitality. Uh, right. Uh, got a bit of a soft spot for vitality because right. it was kind of the French French renaissance, if you will, like with the original lineup. Um, it was because the first tournament that I managed to get an interview, uh, I, I had like a press pass for, you know, Gamescom that's held in Cologne. Oh, sure. Um, so uh, the, that's how I've kind of found out the competitive scene and Counter-Strike I was playing it. Um, I was actually, ironically, lining up to go and watch a Halo tournament, but the queue was too long. Um, this is back in 2014. So the guy, you know, who was man in the queue said, oh, if you want to go watch something similar, there's some Counter-Strike going on just around the corner. And I was like, oh, fuck it. You know what? Well, like, we don't know if we're going to get in here. The line's really long. Um, so we went round. And obviously 2014 was the fucking major. Yeah, yeah. That was held in Gamescom. I mean, it's insane that that was actually less busy than a Halo tournament, and there was maybe you know three, four hundred people in the audience. Um, so I ended up going in there, getting to see um, NIP winning, which was mad. Um, and then the following year, obviously the major wasn't there; it went to the Langsess, Um, But there was the Intel Extreme Masters there, which is where MB won. Um, and at that point, we'd like set up a website with a couple of mates. Um, we were just kind of emailing what whoever. Uh, we could find a contact for for any kind of conventions to see if they give us a press bar. Some would just say a polite fuck off, um, which is fair enough because sure. we weren't exactly a legit website. Um, and then some would give us an opportunity like ECS in London and strangely enough, Gamescom. Um, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to try my luck. Um, go up to the stage manager for IEM and uh, Evie had just won and uh, asked if I could interview you know, one of the person winning team and they were like, yeah, of course, like you've got the right accreditation, which I kind of couldn't believe. Um, so it ended up actually being Apex I interviewed Ooh, with. Okay. It off. Um, and that was obviously back in this sort of entry fragger days. Sure. That was when Happy was leading the team. And at that moment, I was like, hey, this is my first kind of proper legit CS interview. Um, and I just really enjoyed their play style as a team because that was back in the day when like Kenny was on the lineup. Um, obviously him all thing back then is just like, uh, it's kind of weird to hear people the, the Monacy comparison saying, you know, that's kind of the similar sure. play style. Um, not weird in the sense that it doesn't make sense, but it's just, uh, you know, Kenny always sticks out in my head as one of sort of the orpers. Um, and it's strange to think that he's now not really um, a part of the competitive scene. Um, so, yeah, it was just kind of a, I thought they were a really interesting team. And it was the time when they had a bit of a rivalry with TSM. They obviously went on to win a uh, question yes. poker and then, um, that same year I came back to in 2015 came back for the major in Cologne and that was the famous Envy making it to the grand finals against Fnatic and I think they were up something like 15 to 8 on Dust 2 yes. and then Fnatic called that timeout and everything crumbles like yes. Kenny S is crying on the stage it sure. was an emotional mess um and I had a group of friends who we kind of all followed different teams. We were kind of all in our own camps of, oh, this team's the best, this team's the best. And it's maybe the closest I've ever come to kind of fandom culture myself. Like I'm right. not uh, somebody that massively follows celebrities or like sports teams or anything. Um, but it was a a fun way to get extra invested <coughs> into the competitive scene, particularly when you have friends who are kind of supporting rival teams. So we, you know, sit on, I guess it would have been Skype or TeamSpeak at the time. Um, to watch all the all the tournaments that were going on um, and kind of, you know, jab fun at each other. Of course. If our teams had lost. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of where it, where it stemmed from was getting the opportunity to interview Apex a little bit and then uh, managed to interview a couple of the other players just at events that I would go to or just go with my group of friends for it kind of just be like our... We were at uni at the time, so if there was like a cheaper location that we could go to... Um, then that was it, you know, um, that was our kind of holidays for the year, um, which is really fun. And then getting to incorporate the kind of writing and interviewing side occasionally at some of those events was, um, yeah, a really cool extra bit of access that um, I imagine is harder to get now. And I don't know whether I would get away with it just having such a small site. But, um, yeah, it was really cool that uh, TOs were open to kind of any kind of coverage and, um, yeah, gave us access to a lot of uh, local cool opportunities. Yeah, if, if someone goes back and they use the advanced Twitter search function, which no one ever does, they think I'm like a wizard that I can bring these tweets back from the audience. You can just search, guys. If they go back, they will find loads of tweets in 2015 where Freya's like, Kenny on point, 
Kenny's here, like there's a whole bunch of those. There's some good, yeah, exactly. And then also I found one that did crack me up, which is when Envious finally wins Dream at Clues the Poker, you even say you're going to buy the T-shirt, like the major winning T-shirt or whatever. Like the one. Yeah, apparently you did. So you were a true fan. Okay, that's cool. I still have it. You know what? That's so ironic. Like I was sorting through my jerseys the other day um, and there's some, you know, where like I'll, I'll put them in storage and then some that I like to, uh, you know, keep around and use for sports or like having my, having my office set up. And I came across the fucking gold Envy logo, major winning t-shirt. And I was like, you know what? I have to keep this somewhere accessible. Like this was where it all started from. Yeah. Yes. No, and, and the reason I bring this up is because I actually always said to people, that's one of the strengths I immediately noticed when I saw you do interviews and heard you work with Face. It was a lot of people who come into the industry, I mean, in your particular job, sometimes people don't come from esports. I mean, obviously they have the camera skills. That's why they do it. They come from mainstream or they come from another esport. That's just a classic thing at the moment is to swap games. But the difference is that person is then going to have an uphill challenge learning the game and learning the scene and the history of it. And all. They're going to have a lot. Of, it's, going to, it's kind of an information dense field. Whereas I could tell in your case, you actually, you're authentically a fan. Like you did not, you, the reason you knew the storylines is because you were there, you were watching the matches, you, you were following it along even before you started the journalism and even when you be, just initially began right yeah yeah exactly no I think that's um something that I mean even to this day right like we talk about the history like on the desks that most of the people that I work with now um have been in the scene even longer than I have and it's really nice to kind of have those um not necessarily niche reference points but um yeah being able to look back on those moments together and some of the guys were playing back then, some were coaching, some were, you know, doing different types of talent work in the field. Um, and I think it's a, it, it's an interesting, um, I've, I've been asked by a few like other people in different games, like, would you come and cover this game? Would you ever be interested in doing desk hosting or interviewing for, for this title? Um, and I've always been hesitant of doing that because uh, exactly to the point you're saying is that, each esport has such a rich and dense history, and I don't think I don't want to do it a disservice. Not saying that anybody coming over no, to, no. to CS is doing that, but from my personal opinion, it's like sure. it is just all about CS. Like that is what I've always been invested in. Nothing has really scratched that itch like Counter Strike, and I think authenticity is 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 quite important. Just because uh, you 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 can tell when somebody yes. is genuinely invested in something. Um, and I think that's an important part of connecting with the community and yeah, actually, you know, being, being in this for the long haul. If your first interview, as you just stumble across is with Apex of all people, and then later on, at this point in time, we're talking like eight years later, you're actually hosting the Blast Paris Major where Apex wins the Major and you're like, right, there. that must be pretty surreal. It must, it must be kind of crazy to think of that time span. Yeah, particularly when, you know, everybody's saying like eight years since he won his first and then yes. now he's sort of that transition as a player and how much he's grown. Um, it is, you know, not to sound uh, not sophistic, but it is a reflection point uh, for myself as well, because it's like, OK, this was when I was first starting out. Um, and not only um, looking at the growth that's happened, but for me, it wasn't ever necessarily even achievable to do live work because those interviews I was doing was pre-recorded and if I made any mistakes or if anything wasn't wasn't quite right you know you can cut stuff out you can you can edit whatever but when you're live you're live that's it like anything that you're it's coming out of your mouth it's going right out um which was something that I just never thought I would be any good at and you know there was um back when I was watching then it was uh people like obviously Richard Lewis um Red Eye got Smix as well. Like there's so many uh, people that were so world class oh, sure. um, and had so much experience that I was just like, you know what? Is it even something that I don't know that I'd be any good at? Um, but is it something that's even worth pursuing? Because there are just so many really talented people already in the field. Um, and it isn't until somebody else kind of says to you, like, you know, like we've got a little bit of belief, which I wouldn't, <laughs> which sounds kind of sad to reflect back on it now and go, oh, I was the person that kind of put myself down in that situation um but it also is a very i've never heard any two persons stories about how they've got into live broadcasting be the same it's always a kind of a combination of knowing the right people right place right time saying yes to opportunities um and there kind of isn't a linear path so it's a 
it's not something that you can always, uh, particularly back then, just go like, this is what my goal is and I am going to achieve this. Like, for me, it ended up just being just luck um, of how I kind of stumbled into where I am today. By the way, one thing I wanted to ask you, because I've, I've obviously never been in the position when I started the joke is there was no Twitter and it was just a very tiny scene, so there wasn't any people to do this. But in your case, I wondered, right, sometimes when, when someone comes on the scene, people just know that, like, I can sort of get in on the next hype train. I can sort of be like, oh, yeah, great to see you. Oh, excellent job, you know. And there can be a lot of sort of, like, maybe well-intentioned, but not really that meaningful sort of praise, you know, and it's easy to say, By the way, it's easy to go hire this person if you're not the one doing the hiring, you know, anyone can say that. But what I want to know is this. A lot of people I know who've come up as talent say to me that actually early on, when someone legit in the scene does that, like, they tag you and say, like, hey, I enjoyed this performance performance by this person or even better maybe they dm you privately and say hey great job like rest to see on the-. they say even though like to the person sending that message you might just seem like you know it's just all right just a little message i'm firing off they, they say that can actually that helps with some of this like esteem or believing like you're supposed to be is it true yeah massively um i think the way i started out was um you know it was quite slow and steady i was just doing um back then face it stuff so it was literally just ecs i came on for ecs season five which was in 2018 then obviously the major after that um which was a complete surprise i didn't expect to be doing that so early on um and then was basically just doing two seasons of ecs every year and you know dream hack opens would sometimes reach out um the occasional other tournament here and there but it was quite you know a, a slow start which i think played into my favor because it wasn't too much too soon and it gave me the opportunity to kind of build my own strengths my own personality and uh, reflect on how I wanted to be viewed in the scene it wasn't about doing everything all at once um, because at the end of the day I was able to work on it outside in terms of other content opportunities um, the face it youtube channel was doing stuff on that um which was really good it was kind of a very wholesome all-round experience um and it meant that it took a little while to get noticed by some people but it meant a lot more when people did reach out because it wasn't like i was just plastered everywhere um so i remember getting um i think it was ecs season five i think it was the first event um moses sent me a really nice message but prior to that he um had just given me like really useful little bits of advice for somebody that had never been on a live camera before and it sounds so funny to say it now but i would have the microphone sometimes crossed over my arm the player was here right he was just like just hold it in this hold it in this hand it looks way more natural he'd give me little tips here and there on how to like position my body just to make it a little more comfortable and it's those little details that to me not only showed that he, he was like a genuinely nice person and Jake and it's absolutely wonderful um but it was nice that i could talk to him like a friend really early on um and he genuinely gave a shit which was really nice um so i think the yeah kind of combination of not only people you know saying nice things is always nice to receive but giving you that constructive feedback i think is even more important because it shows that people genuinely care about where you're going and want you to succeed and kind of grow as a person right and i think there's a difference between seeing something in twitch chat or seeing something on you know a reddit thread or hftv forum versus somebody who's experienced in the industry um and has kind of seen and done it all and has been through those those growing periods themselves um yeah to kind of give you those little nuggets of wisdom um which you don't often get but it's really nice when people do do share those kind of things People will know the comic book origin story of Freya is obviously you apply to this face it like thing where it's like a community thing where you send in like the reason why you should be the person who works on the event. And if people have seen the video still exists to this day, you can go look it up. It's actually, I have to say, it's not bad, actually. You do a pretty good job at it. Like, obviously, you're a fan. There's a lot of like, it's sort of the... The TikTok generation, you know, there's a lot of like, oh, a lot of performative elements of it where you're trying to seem really happy, <laughs> your eyes are like super jazzed up, etc. But well, here's my question to you. It's the obvious question. Why has no one ever asked this? Why didn't you win? Why, why, why wasn't that because, the winning entry? Right. So, so uh, there wasn't many entries because, you know, it's making a video, it's editing, sure, it's, yeah. it's a time consuming thing. It's not just submitting your email and your name and saying, I love Dust 2, whatever. Um, so there was, um, 
another entry at the time, which is a guy called Zodiac, who's actually an editor. Now. Oh, yes. Uh, he was editing at the time, yes. but he now edits. He does He does frag stuff. movies so and he, stuff, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. He does a lot of, um, I mean, he freelances for basically everybody. Um, so he'd entered, um, and his was more, you know, an editing style. Right. Um, but the brief was, you know, make it creative. And then the moment I pressed upload, uh, you know, Boaster from, yeah. uh, he was in CS. Right now, but used to be in Albany, yeah, sure at the time. <laughs> played league of legends for yeah, yeah. Like he's the type of guy that seems to touch any game and just be amazing um he uploaded a song and as soon oh, as i saw no. that i was like i'm oh, not winning done, yeah. there's right. no way i'm winning right. yeah yeah and it was an amazing song oh, no. um, so right. he ended up winning <laughs> <laughs> whereas yeah that, i see what you mean I, I, now i get it because obviously i only saw yours so now i get it like yours is pretty good but if they're doing songs and edited videos then yours is just like hey i had a mexican themed <laughs> birthday and they're like well it's like, it's like, you know, participation. Like, yeah, well done. We're going to put that on the fridge, but we're taking the guy with the full song and like West End show style. Like, I can't lie. Maybe he should have won. Audio, yeah, maybe Boston did deserve to win yeah. that one, to be fair. Okay. <laughs> when he got this call up, though, the other detail that I've heard you talk about in a few interviews was... It's not just what people think, which is face it. We're like, right, this is our person. So like, you know, we're going to like move them. Obviously, you know, we're going to put them straight on the major. Like, supposedly they brought you. Yeah, they you did some ECS. Like you do some, um, obviously the minor. And then out of nowhere, they just tell you like, by the way, you're doing the major. Oh, and not only that, it's the major in London. Like, that's pretty ridiculous. Yeah. What's that called? Was, like? um, oh, man, it, it was insane. Because... Um, ECS finished, um, it, this was the time period when, so obviously we now have RMRs, so it's quite different, but the minors happened maybe a similar period of time to how the RMRs yes. happen now for the major, but then you had the challenges and legend stage. And then at this point in time, we had a big enough break between the end of legends and the beginning of playoffs that there was a whole other tournament in there. That was when DreamHack Stockholm, North winning, MSL getting right. the MVP. Um, there was a really big uh, chunk of time um, between that. So finished the minors and um, things, things were really happy. Um, and I was, you know, just kind of learning the intricacies of the industry, like who was responsible for what. Like I basically just come, I I'd graduated uni and the day I graduated uni, I went to work the minors. Like I was super fresh, hadn't really had a, you know, proper full time job before. Um, so I came into that and the final day, final couple days of the minor, um, Parla was working this as well, uh, doing the interviews too. And we had this uh, content skit with um this Swedish content team who are absolutely uh, amazing. They're called Black Molly now. Um, and they had this idea to film a song called I'll See You at the Major. And I was singing in it. And I was like, well, I, I guess I have to do this. It okay. will probably be somewhere buried. And okay. it, 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 it's, yeah, I can't sing. Is it so cringe? It, it, it was done in a good way. Oh, All right, okay. I'm just terrible at singing. Okay. So I don't think I've really ever been able to watch it back. But halfway through i was like well if they're getting me to sing i'll see you at the major i guess i'm coming to the major then like i guess i'm going to be there but that can't be real like just the disbelief in my head of like there's no way there's no sure. way like maybe this is my sort of last hurrah um and then we had the break between the minors and the major starting and at that point i was um talking to some of the producers who are actually still um still part of now efg um and this was when we were producing the major player profiles so on top of what i was doing on the live element uh, my job leading into the minors was to do research for teams make spreadsheets of just all the info that everybody needed to know so all the content team was on the same page or the producers had kind of access to stuff because it's quite a time consuming job um and they didn't they just didn't have the resources to do it themselves so they were like you know we'll pay you for these kind of research days these content days um, and then the period of time between the minors and the challenger starting was when I started doing research for these player profiles, which was Rops, uh, Stewie and Shox. And that was when we started to film them with Tom Newman, um, who just obviously released the Rebel documentary. So that was kind of starting in tandem. And it was uh, there were some overlapping days when we were at Copenhagen filming the Stewie 2K documentary, which overlapped with the start of the challenger stage. Um, and then I got my contract through for, you know, the payment terms and stuff. And it shows the whole chunk of the major. And I was like, well, does this mean I'm on camera? And they're like, of course. Why Why wouldn't you be? Like, it worked at the minors. So we'd love to bring you back. You probably won't get to do the winner's interview or anything like that because you're still quite new. But um, we'd love to have you on to kind of offer that support. 
basically wherever we could fit you in, which I was super down to do. So it was maybe kind of a combination of having the content element uh, side of things and being kind of the researcher. And because back in that day, things were, I mean, this was the era of four better threes a day, every oh, single sure. day. So you needed that rotation of, you know, Parler would come on and do a certain part of the day and then I come on and kind of be his relief at the end of the day. Um, so it was kind of, it wasn't ever really told to me verbatim that it was going to be happening, but it was just through a series of like, you're involved in this, you're involved in this, like, we might as well just keep you, it's, it seems to be working, um, which was really, yeah, kind of another one of those right place, right time, just saying yes to to everything, taking taking a chance. The other thing as well about doing the job of a desk host or an interviewer is you're obviously completely at the mercy of the person you're interviewing as to whether there's like a big moment or anyone has anything that they remember. Like, unfortunately, even during the event, we get lots of great info. You know, your brain sort of deletes that. You don't remember that when you remember a semi-final. You obviously then also got the crazy good luck that that iconic Zemo moment happened. Like that moment to this day, I'm sure everyone remembers. I mean, it's very associated with him, obviously, and the bigger his name gets, the more people will always remember. I mean, the joke is to this day, some people who don't watch the event still think he doesn't speak English. It's like he does. He's done like a million interviews since then, but this is kind of cool. Right? You, you kind of got your own pop at the first major. Yeah, it was um, kind of a a good thing to come out of a um, what I thought was my own mess up initially at the beginning, because uh, normally whenever I'm doing any kind of interviews that are pre match, I will go up and just speak to the player and say, hey, we're going to be having a chance stage. I'm going to be asking you about this, this, and this, because first of all, you might not be able to hear me because the crowd can get really loud. Um, and secondly, you might just want to have some time to prepare some answers. And if there's something you don't want to talk about, which I'm pitching in these questions, then you can tell me now, save any embarrassment, right? Um, and because the show match had so many people involved and, you know, th things get kind of crazy before a major grand final, we're kind of getting ready with other things we're pre-recording other content i didn't have the opportunity to go and speak to these players and say hey i'm going to be in the booth with you not only sort of coaching but we're going to be doing check-ins uh, every so often um and it's kind of poetic that he ended up being the last player it was uh, i remember shazam was for before him and there was like a couple of other players who you know would give um some funny answers or just kind of you know off, off the cuff things and then ending on him every single time, just going, I don't know, no, no, no. Sure. Um, which I, I've, I've spoken to him about this. Uh, it was actually the Stockholm major because that was um, weirdly the next time that I, no, the, I'd seen him at London in 2019 when Vitality won in Wembley, um, which is almost a year after he played in that show match. And then obviously COVID happened. Um, and I remember seeing him in Stockholm and I was like, I need to buy you a drink just as an apology for putting you through that and making things awkward for you. And he was like, it's hilarious. I love sure. watching back on that moment because it's a totally different version of me. Um, and I'm going to be honest, I was just really nervous. Like I <laughs> right. was thought I was just playing CS. Right. Um, and then this girl comes up and starts talking to me and he was just like, you know, there's all, all these sounds going on around you. He's obviously got a headset on. So half the time he was like, I, I couldn't even hear what you were asking me. Um, so that was just his natural response, but it's been kind of nice to, um, have had the chance to chat to him about it. Obviously I see him a lot more now. Um, and he's somebody that it, it's kind of crazy to see that character development and sure. how much he's grown as a person. And like, he's got that personality now. Like whenever we get him up on the desk, like not only is he massively humble, but he has like a bit of a cheeky side yeah, to him yeah. and like incredibly eloquent as well, yes. which is, uh, yeah, nice to see. Yeah, I would say if anyone still is unaware of that, just go watch after they win the Blast Paris Major. He comes on the desk and he actually like goes like unfiltered for like 20 minutes. He's given all like spicy tea. It's pretty good, actually. Like he, had, he, was, he seemed super fluent and really comfortable. He was even like addressing all sorts of, yeah, it's, it's mad. If you haven't seen him like that before, it'd be really eye-opening if they've already remember that classic moment, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. I think the thing that stands out in my head from that with his interview was him coming up and almost immediately saying like, you know, it's not to my team, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, uh, yeah, you know, sure, it, it is in part to your team, but like, you, you've got to have like, I don't want to say an ego, but like, he's so, he's such a good player, but he's so humble at the same sure. time. And the first person to go, no, 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 it's my team supporting me. It's my team setting sure. me up. Um, and yeah, at that point, I think, I think in that moment, I was just like, how the fuck are you so humble? Like every single time, how are you like this? Like, this is your moment to just relish it and go, yeah, 
at the mo- like right now, I am the best player in the world. I am the major champion. I finally got the major to a, a title to my name. Um, but yeah, he's always just such a pleasure and um, really bubbly and like just an enthusiastic person. Like you were kind of saying about that authenticity, you can tell he just enjoys every element of the Counter Strike scene and being at an event and participating in content. Um, he's one of those guys that I don't think I've ever seen him in a bad mood, even after a loss. Like he's one of those players that you could actually go up to and do an interview after a loss because right. you know he would give some good insights. And he'd also have <laughs> there is an element of him I feel that he is just kind of happy to be a part of the scene. And obviously, you know, he's he's striving for really good results, but he's got that authentic hunger and passion just for, for Counter Strike. One thing I want to ask is this, but I have to set it up carefully, which is if people don't notice, what I'll do is I'll, I'll initially sort of burn myself to make it not seem harsh. So in the world of being an analyst on the desk, right, I actually am weird enough that I do just want to have like two minutes to do my angle, get like a funny thing off and then go and watch the match, right? Most analysts you'll notice secretly want to be the colour commentator and be on the final and be doing, you know, be a superstar. If you don't know behind the scenes, guys, they also get to be like the rock stars that arrive for their like two hours of work a day, like, oh, hey, guys, like they roll in at 4 p.m., you know, they're, they're still drinking the, let's just say, the, the hydrating materials, getting ready for their game. They go out there, they nail it like rock stars. Like, blah, blah, blah. They're, they're living in the moment, doing all those videos themselves. I can't believe I'm here. Epic, epic, epic. It's like, that is what I will we'll say. A lot of the analysts wish they were that guy. And you'll notice that's actually happened in our field. Some of the absolute best analysts have become the commentators now. And that's how the cycle goes. Well, similarly, almost everyone you've seen be a desk host, um, started as an interviewer on stage and a host on stage. And you'll notice they don't want to just stay as the host on stage. Cause look, it's not bad. You get to do some cool things, but to be the desk course is like that plus more. And you get, you get to be more part of the show. You get to even anchor the show. Was that always a goal of yours? I mean, there's some, some people are very, very good at interviews and they just, that's just their thing. And that's their lane. They stay in it. You, you got quite quickly transitioned and took these gigs like at DreamHack, et cetera, to be the desk host. Was it something you wanted to do? Was it, was it a, a different challenge? Yeah, I think there was a challenge element to it. Um, the first time that I was kind of offered the role was um, a year later from ECS season five to season seven, the last event we did in London, which was um, 2019, the one that Vitality won. Um, and it was actually off the back of a couple of the producers um, saying to me, you know, like we we feel like you have the knowledge now to be transitioning into this role. Like it's obviously a lot more responsibility, a lot more airtime. Um, you've got to learn how to have that uh, you know, a, a relationship with the producer in your ear while somebody else is having a conversation because when you're doing interviewing and stage hosting, for the most part, that's not a massive part of your job. Um, for the most part, you're not ever really expected to fill as a stage host sure. because we've got the desk as a buffer to, you're going to do the intros, you're going to do the team interviews, player interviews, and then the stage opening is going to happen then that's going to stop teams are going to go into the booth and then if there's any issues the desk will pick up and fill there um which is the reliance on kind of being a little bit more spontaneous because i think the stage hosting and interviewing is a lot more structured in a strange way you've always got much more of a time constraint in both of those uh, those two positions whereas the desk host it relies on you being a bit more fluid sometimes it relies on you wrapping stuff up quicker than you anticipated more often than not, it relies on you longing things out and filling things if there's any kind of issues going on behind the scenes um, and making sure that it's not obvious that that's what you're doing. I think that's another um, another skill that you have to learn to develop is keeping the conversation interesting and engaging without saying, well, I guess we've got some time to fill because I'm yes. just giving it away yes, to the audience. Exactly. That that's, yeah, yeah, um, that something's going wrong and you just want to keep it uh, engaging and interesting for everybody that's you know anticipating the game starting um so i think that was something that initially i didn't know whether i had the the skills uh to to do that because i just i never tested it out um and it wasn't until the producers came up to me and just said i think you're ready to do this um and it also meant um in a really lovely way that um i got to work with snix for the first time because oh, right. um if people don't know she uh she obviously worked full-time for twitch um, and then ECS got picked up and sponsored by YouTube. So it was YouTube exclusive from 2018 until it ceased in 2020, which meant that she couldn't work on it, which was really unfortunate. So I kind of came in uh, sort of as her replacement. 
um, she was off doing, uh, she was doing obviously ESL stuff, DreamHack stuff, um, she was doing the style ladder major as well. Um, but it was really nice because she got to come back um, as the stage host because the YouTube deal had ceased by then. Um, and that was actually one of the moments where I was like, wow, I feel like this is actually legitimate now because I'm standing alongside somebody who I, I've looked up to. And she was, um, I mean, she, she's a trailblazer, not only for women in the scene, in my opinion, but um, also just stage hosting and interviewing sure. in general. Like she's, she's so personable with the players and she is exactly like that off camera, like so authentic, um, really good at building those relationships and uh, incredibly friendly. Um, and that was a really, that was a really big moment from that event that I was, I actually get to work alongside her. I get to pick her brain about all these elements. Um, and it's kind of one of those moments where you get to realize like everybody around you is actually still learning. Um, and that should be something that you're always doing in this role. Like, I don't feel like there is necessarily the best in any category. People have their strengths and weaknesses all over the field, but it's not like you get to a certain point and like you've beat, counter-strike you know like hosting counter-strike it's always it's always this learning process um and she really made me realize that like you know you just gotta um that fluidity and that spontaneity that's something you've got to nurture now because that's something you're going to have to rely on um but forever in this industry and i think that's a really healthy thing to have a mindset of um but yeah the first time doing it was just overwhelming in some ways because i I'd underestimated how much production do talk to you constantly. Oh, and sure. I love it now. I love it when production are talkative because it means I know exactly what's coming up. Yes. It means I know if there's any issues, exactly what all the timings are. But when you first start off, it can be quite jarring. Um, so that was probably the biggest adaptation from going to stage hosting and in interviews to desk hosting. And I didn't think I could love anything more than interviewing. But desk hosting is it. Like, as you said, there's so much control that you get to have. You get to craft. You kind of get to be the the editor of the segment, yeah. right? Um, alongside with your analysts and stuff, they're obviously giving you input. But having that close relationship with the producer um, and having that trust um, is so important. And I think after that event, I was like, I, you know, I found it. I found what I feel is kind of my purpose. Not that I don't love interviewing, but um, this was really like ignited a fire that, I didn't know I had. Um, and it's something that, yeah, I've always, if I would have the choice, I'd always kind of go with desk hosting over, over any other position. To find like some little uh, extra angles no one else will have for their interview. So tough luck. You just weren't, you weren't there guys. You're just Googling stuff now. I went back on our DM on Twitter. And what I found was in late 2019, there could have been a, a slightly different path to your career because what happened was, if people might remember, there was an event. It's actually the first event Maui Snake did, Epicenter in Russia, right? And what happened was, this is a very, this is why it's a very weird event, guys. I'm the host of this event. And I, spoiler, I'm not a host. It's just because I've done a million podcasts. What happened was, I was the first person they contacted and because Epicenter waited way too long to hire the staff. You have to understand, guys, their event literally ended, I think, like four days before Christmas is what meant like that. Like everyone either had already taken the rest of the year off and was like not interested, you know, I've shut down for the year or people were hired to other events. And what happened was, I, they said, we basically like, well, we got you. And then they were like, even though this is mental for a TO to say, they're still contracted. They're like, who else should we hire? It's like, oh, so I'm just building the event. Oh, okay. So what happened famously was I was looking and I was saying like, right, you could hire like people like Potter. There's actually, we got as analysts, you know, I was trying to think of all these other names. I was contacting every other person I knew, all the other people who were the top analysts. Everyone was busy. And then for host, no joke, I gave them a list of about eight people, think like everyone famous I can think of. And everyone was busy or couldn't be contacted. And I said, well, you, you, what about Freya? You were on the list, right? And unfortunately, at the time, I believe you just, you you did like a dream hack. I think it was the one in Spain, maybe Seville or something. There it was, was Seville, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think this was like right at the same time, or maybe ended a day before, so you couldn't get the visa. It was something like that. And so basically, I know they tried to reach out to you. And if people don't know, this is the funny element to it. One, you didn't do that. You obviously did the dream hack instead. And I don't blame you because in this scenario, like you would have had to do some really weird thing. You think you would have had to like fly to Kiev, then like they have to get the visa that day, and then you have to. Oh, like it sounds like a nightmare. I won't lie, but. 
it would have been cool. And then the other detail, this is a little detail you can use to needle him if you want, is because I said, right, I'll tell you what, if you're gonna, if we're gonna go to the point we're gonna actually hire, like you're not available, no one's available. If, if we're gonna have, basically have to hire someone who's never done the job before, just let me do it. You know what, I'll host and basically I'll just be like half analyst, half host. I'll do a basic job, you know, I'll, I'll throw to the stuff. And then in doing so though, you have to make me one deal though. The last analyst spot you have to give to this Maui snake kid. And by the way, that is absolutely what I said because he hadn't done any events. He was just some nobody and they were oh, okay. And basically they brought him in. So if you ever, if, if Maui ever, you know, get spicy, just point out, you actually could have like, block his whole career basically if you'd have said yes there would be no Maui Snake because I'd be in Maui Snake seat and I'd be the one popping off so I'm just saying you actually have that over there's some deep law for people who don't know I actually helped Maui Snake's career yes you did wow. you basically stepped okay. aside and said go on Maui you can have a career mate I've got one as well so you can have one too I'll see you at Flashpoint in a few years exactly that's the exactly. handshake <laughs> yes by the way along these lines right after that even though, sadly, obviously, the world went online, so you didn't get to actually get your chance on the circuit. Famously, the way people prove themselves on the circuit is you do the smaller events, so you got these DreamHack gigs. And there's one detail I want to ask you about here, which is when you did DreamHack Leipzig, which is one of the last tournaments before we went online, I noticed a very interesting detail, and there's a mad photo from back then. There's a photo, and if I showed you guys this photo now, you're going to go, I know that photo, Blast 2020. It's like, no, 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 no. This is actually from DreamHack Leipzig. Like, Freya is with Maniac and Pimp. Oh, God, yes, yes. So you, we did that all yeah. together. You were all the way I back then. Because people don't know, before the online period, obviously, That's like that so was the day too, right? You guys were all trying to crack through together, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think part of us at that one as I think well. So too. It was when they just got three analysts in, so there was an analyst rotation, sure. no host rotation back then, but there was at the start of yes. maybe having three and only one person has to do the super long days. But I forgot that that was um because that was just after Maniac had started doing yeah, all yeah. kind of stuff what in like twenty early twenty eighteen. End of twenty seventeen, probably so, yes. something like that. Because it was kind of the for, for both of them, it was sort of the pro Yes. Side of their career ending, and obviously may not go into coaching and stuff. But yeah, that's that's kind of wild that that and that was the last tournament before COVID, right? It was the one yeah. big one, and then we were yep. all hyped on big, and then everything Indeed. went to shit. What, who were those guys back then, though? When you first meet these people, because if people don't know it, they're very very different people, and like obviously Pimp himself is just he's a character. So who were these people when you met them? Oh, su super friendly. Um, I So I'd worked, I guess I'd worked with Maniac at the Europe Face It Miners. Um, and obviously, if, with my affili affiliation with Envy, um, I'd remembered him competing and being, you know, uh, I think he was like assistant coaching coach. or something yeah, yeah. with the team. Yeah, he was coach, yeah. Um, and then he was doing like a bit of analyst work or did a bit of analyst work. So that was something that I immediately bonded over him with was, you know, like, let's just talk about old envious and the good old days when the French team was on top. Cause at that point, uh, there wasn't really, it was pre vitality kind of entering the scene. Um, and Jacob, I don't think he's changed one bit. <laughs> okay. I love working with Jacob because he will just say shit how it is, but, and maybe that's a, that's a Danish trait of like, the humor is quite similar I yeah. think, to British humor yes. where they do get sarcasm immediately. And I was like, that's, that's cool because sometimes like, I think Europe kind of differs in those elements. Like Germans don't get sarcasm so much. Um, and kind of, I, I think I remember immediately bonding over him with just the, just the humor element. And he ha has a way of like making jokes, which is just like, just so upfront and so verbose sometimes, um, but hilarious. And they were both two people that, I mean, still to this day, like we have to do in comparison, not as long days, um, but there's always that ki kind of like flair to them, you know, like they always want to, they always want to challenge themselves. Um, and I remember getting back from, uh, I think it was, it must have been like a blast groups at some point, like when we were just kind of coming out of COVID. Um, and my boyfriend had bought me a book, which was a dictionary of idioms, basically. Okay. So they're kind of like sayings, metaphors, similes, sure. all that sort of stuff. Perfect for and this, I bring it sounds it to the like. Green yeah. room. 
yes it, it's amazing it's really cool he'd got it from a charity shop um and i'd bring it to the green room and i would say pick a page between one and 200 and flick through the page and then pick a number between one and seven and we'd pick out little idioms for each other to get into the segments so sometimes if, yeah, if you want to go back and watch some 2021 blast segments there's quite a few weird british sayings <laughs> right, kind of okay. plotted in there okay. um, but it's really cool because they uh, you know there's always this kind of uh, element of wanting to wanting to bet yourself and vocabulary i think is something i mean i um native english speaker i can't speak any other languages and you do kind of forget that for some of these people it oh, is sure. their second yes. language yes. which is Amazing when I mean, particularly with Yanko, um, the Serbian idioms I've heard are just oh, they're, mental, they're just yeah. poetic. They're <laughs> fucking crazy. Um, and getting to hear that coming from a Danish standpoint and you know, Swiss, French, mainly speaking standpoint. Um yeah, and I've always liked that it, it's nice to be able to kind of share those things with people. And from the moment I first started working with them. Maynex has been quite a poetic speaker and still is, um, able to elaborate on things very well. Whereas Jacob is never afraid to just say things straight up and sometimes not even afraid to sort of throw himself under a bus just for the sake of a narrative. Like he might not even believe what he's saying, but it's bringing some spice. So um, it can be kind of a nice yin and yang when you're working with them. We'll just dot around based on the topic. So to keep the topics together, was it then an interesting experience later where in this online period, people will forget this. One of the things I actually think allowed Blast to sort of pop off itself, because if you remember in the old days when it was the Blast or Blast Alice and the Blast of Ones and all those jokes we had back in the day, people didn't treat it like a serious tournament. But I remember when everyone raved about the production was during COVID, because at that time, one of the cool things they did was you guys went to the studio. So even though the players couldn't be there, you guys were in the studio and that's where that iconic desk, which to this day is on blast sometimes of you, Pimp Maniac, was established and you were doing all the events. And it was kind of, I, I mean, I, I imagine that setting, like you were saying earlier, when people go through the four best of threes, there's a reason why all the talent from that generation talk like they were in World War One or something like, because obviously you bond over that, you're, you're staying up, you're seeing people take that 20 minute nap on the sofa and hope someone doesn't take a photo of them. You see people at their like no sleep or having issues or get, getting through the third game when they're praying it's a 2 zero and all that. Like it, it must have been that. My, my it must be that times 10 when it was during the COVID period, right? When you this very weird travel situation and no one knows what's happening in the industry, which got online for you. What was that vibe like to have the three of you there, all the events? I think it was, um, for me, it was kind of a, a bit of a different vibe uh, to the two of them because they were obviously doing stuff for Blast during that online period for, for all of it. So obviously uh, we were in Flashpoint when everything kicked off. Um, and I don't know if anybody remembers, but Blast had like sent around those like at-home kits where yes. everybody had the sort of same synergized setup. Um, and they were a part of that. So there was a lot of tournaments going on. And at the time I wasn't involved with any Blast stuff. Um, it actually was through doing a Ballarat event for them um that they were like yeah you know what you should come on and do do some cs for us start doing some interviews remotely because at that time um the uk was on everyone's red list so i yes. couldn't even get to Denmark. i wanted to um but they had been really really grinding in that online period they I, I was doing you know a few dreamhack opens but because of covid some of those got condensed and then the rmrs happened and dreamhack summer was an rmr so a few of those events were kind of merged into one um which was still good for me to continue kind of getting my legs but they were basically doing I, i'm pretty sure everything um so when i met up with them again it was um you know, they, they were clearly a level above me. They were clearly more used to the setup. They'd actually been in the studio for maybe three or four months prior from kind of summer um, 2020, which was when uh, the UK went back on the red list. And it wasn't until, um, yeah, I don't know, it must have been April it was like 20, spring 2021. 20, yeah. yeah, yeah, no. So it was a good, you know, six six months after they'd actually all been in the studio environment together. And it was always planned for me to come in as a desk host. And the reason I ended up just staying as interviews was simply because I couldn't travel. And the moment it was opened up, I had to go over and obviously do the, uh, there was I think five or six days quarantine at the time was doing all the tests. Um, but it was kind of a surreal experience because um, Scrawny kind of puts it best that period of time with the Blast broadcast was kind of like being in college because we were in these apartment hotels. Um, and once everybody had done their isolation and were COVID free, you basically just keep your doors open and oh, people would come right. in, like you'd dogs, cook for right. each other. And right. Yeah, you'd be playing, you'd be playing games all evening. And I hadn't been a part of that for sort of six or seven months. Um, so it was a it was a really wholesome environment to come into. Um, it was like just a really 
really chill group of guys, but it, it felt like they'd kind of made this family um, and they um, had all been getting their legs in, getting their reps in, in terms of broadcasting stuff. So I definitely felt like I was lagging behind a little bit and and, and I was in all fairness, um, but they were the two guys that were like, you know, they wouldn't, you wouldn't be here unless there was a real reason that you deserve to be here. And we've got your back, basically. We know where the production staff, we've been in the studio like 10 times by now. We know where everything is. Like, we're here to make you feel comfortable. Um, and I'm super grateful for them for, yeah, just making me feel like I was a real part of the team. Um, and continuing to to this day, because it was kind of the only social interaction you got back then. Yes. Like, they made the choice to semi move to to this location um and then we're obviously driving back and forth there because mamo is quite near and um sometimes esl would do events there and they do like these commutes together like jacob would just drive over the bridge um so they had this real connection um which i, I think they still have and i feel like i'm kind of included in that uh, to this day and yeah it's just through them i think having may- maybe that period of time to to see each other in person because it's one thing doing those online events it's a whole other thing actually being there and when you're off air getting that time to just get to know people right one of the reasons i also bring up the epicenter story earlier is because if people aren't aware they, back then it was really hard to break into the talent rotation like obviously there's already plenty of people trying to do all the jobs i mean in york it's like three or four people it's actually very competitive at that point in time if you think of some of the names some of the legendary people some of the newer people and so i imagine even though the actual event didn't end up having all the awesome teams blah 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 it must have been pretty cool to actually get the the flashpoint gig though and to know that like you're doing these two one million dollars i mean we even thought they were lands initially didn't we like even though the teams weren't that great it, it still feels like like if you're pretty sweet the talent people are hired most of them either are tier one now or we're already tier one. There's I had like Sean Gares of that remember initially. Like did, uh, there was some massive names. So what was it like to to come to Flashpoint? Oh, it was amazing. Like the you know the flight from uh, at the time. Uh, what was it? February February March 2020. Um, I was in Australia for my best friend's wedding, and I flew from Sydney uh, to LA. And obviously there was kind of rumors of COVID happening, but I remember kind of all being in the studio together. Um, when we had that beautiful studio set up and having that first meeting and we had like the blind spot area um, and it was kind of like everything was coming to fruition, all the ideas that people had had, because I think the cool thing about Flashpoint was the involvement from talent early on and basically the openness to go, I have this idea, here's what I need to execute it. Um, wouldn't always happen just because of you know of there's always budget constraints and there's always uh, you know personnel constraints but it felt like a very open environment for people to just come with their ideas and even if we couldn't make it happen in that exact uh, you know that that exact concept it would get molded into something else and people it felt like people were very invested in it and it was one of the first times that um, because it was more of a more of a circuit rather than sort of the, the one-off tournaments I was used to doing. Obviously, ECS had the online circuit, but you wouldn't see any of the teams there um, and you wouldn't necessarily get to interact with some of the other talent because some of them, sometimes you'd be broadcasting online. Yes. Um, and it felt like a big collective. Um, and it was, yeah, like, a, 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 as you said, very, like, mix of people from different backgrounds. Obviously, Monty, um, that was the first time I met him. Um, and he's, I mean, veteran of the space. So getting to even you know stand beside somebody like him with so much experience coming from so many different types of games was was really cool and then i think that was a f- that was the first time that i met maui oh um, for sure yeah and he's like it, it, he had such a personality then but it's great to see how much that he's kind of built that um because off camera obviously sometimes uh just i think it does depend on your role which is something that people always say to me like oh you're so different in person it's like yeah because i don't get paid to fucking yap about myself <laughs> on camera. it's talking about counter-strike True. and i can't swear also so yes. it's kind of the, the two in one there um but maui has this way of kind of injecting his personality i think into a broadcast which um which i think i, I could learn from personally um but actually getting to meet him in person was really cool and he comes from such a such a cool background as well um who else was there jason was there ddk bardolf ddk bardolf yeah yeah like such a wild mix of people to think that Sean Gares is now in the Valorant side of things as Potter. well. Potter. Potter, yes, yeah. Yeah, it was, it, it, it's such a shame that it just didn't, 
I mean, nobody could have seen no, no. what happened. The what if coming. of that year is a nightmare just for that, isn't it? Like, imagine if we just had those two tournaments. Because the other thing people don't know is, dude, we literally, if people don't know, our season two was going to be in Europe, in that globe fucking theatre that the major was at the year after. Like, we would, we would, that's, if you think Flashpoint was cool, like, yeah, some online stuff was cool, some skits were cool. If we'd have actually had real lands, guys, the finals were going to be bangers. We were going to make them like major finals, basically. You know, like, for people like us, it would have been insane to actually, like, like you say, have, Inputting things, design the videos. It could, it, the what if or that will always haunt me to some degree. I have to say. Yeah, I think like the London bubble that we ended up doing with the uh, like the green screen stuff was really cool. That was, cool. That was one of like yeah. my favorite content pieces I've ever done was like the Flashpoint News thing, and then just like I have a question about that. Well, able to make the art. Here's the question about that: If people don't know. This is actually, that was sort of a test for you, Freya, because what people don't know is, as you say, uh, I intentionally, me and Monty decided, like, you know, talent is talent, and the producers are the producers, so basically the producers talk to, like, me and Monty about stuff, but we we made, like, a bubble uh, within the bubble, as it were, where if people could just throw ideas out, you know, for those skits, people would throw any idea out. Like, the, the joke is, luckily, because it was, like, Flashback, we had, like, me and Monty, and we're not afraid to banter. Like, actually, the sort of ones that I, I think in an ESL room would go on the cutting room floor, they're actually the real skits. Like, we did, like, fucking bad off do that stupid like gym savings bank we did let Anders do those mental ones about how he's like a psychiatrist and taking DMT or something like we had some yeah, crazy now ones on yes we, yeah, exactly <laughs> these are like the ones where you know you say that as a joke to like break the ice but we actually did these ones for real but one of them right and I actually purposely came up with this because logically you're the only person who could do it you're the person who would just be the basically if people don't know we just made it look like channel 4 news and it's like you know and here we are the top stories at the hour are and then you know as you say you know that screen that's to the left on the camera of the person shows whatever the image is that they talk about and all. And if people don't know, go back and watch this. There's only one line I believe they cut because I did pick someone else and bit naughty because me and someone else helped script this, right? And if you ever go back and watch, the reason why I was very impressed you did this and not only actually nailed it, but even had the balls to do it is because... I didn't hold back on any punches on those actual jokes. If people go and look, those are mad edgy jokes to give if you're someone the opposite. Remember, you've never done any controversial stuff. And some of them low-key, you're flaming like Astralis, you know, like the ESL, the other people in the industry you can have to work with. Was it? Were you at all nervous about that? Did you, did you not worry? Because you, you nailed it. It's amazing. It's still up on YouTube. I think um, something that it is a quality that I respect in people is the ability to be able to laugh at themselves. I think if you can't look at yourself and be self-reflective and go, yeah, I have flaws. Yeah. Some of the shit is funny. Right. Like, and that goes for wider teams, players, all that sort of stuff. Like that's when you become, I think uh, somebody that people could can relate to in a way. Um, and you become more likable as a person if you're able to go like, yeah, this should like, you know, we weren't doing anything personal. Like there was no, nothing no, nasty no. in there. Sure. It was just like funny little, little traits yes. and attributes. Um, and just little memes that were yes. in Counter-Strike. Um, and I think if you're not able to look at those things and go, oh yeah, that's kind of funny. Like the writing's got to be good one. Like that's always important. I think like as this term punching down, like, don't punch down when you write. Um, but the way it was written was, was I think really good. Um, and yeah, if you're, if you're somebody that can't laugh at themselves for some things, then I don't know. I just think that's, that's an attribute. I don't, I don't really understand. Like, um, yeah. So I don't think I was necessarily nervous more. So I think if, if, if something's written badly, then that makes all the difference, right? Like, it's got to be a clever way of, of writing a script. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't think at the time I kind of thought too deeply about it because at the end of the day, it isn't, it isn't that deep, right? Sure. It's not like we were making sure. a documentary. It's just, it's just meant sure. and to make people laugh. And in a time as kind of, you know, dark as that, when everybody's at home, everybody's stuck, um, making people laugh is kind of kind of the best thing you can do and I I feel like that was just the vibe of that whole whole tournament was um you know nothing nothing's too much obviously some things are too much but the sort of uh concepts that were coming out um it felt like there was always a way of kind of getting injecting a bit of humor in there um yeah so I don't I don't know I'd maybe it's I, I didn't really think about it too deeply at the time and I'm glad I'm glad I didn't because yes, it was uh, indeed one of the funniest things I feel like I've done by the way, a, a question I have when you were with Flashpoint was this was for season two, is you did a bunch of like it was almost like historical 
narrative building slash mini documentary about some of the teams and some of the players, especially like the big names. And what's interesting is I remember you actually submitted these to me, but What's funny is I actually did try to give people a lot of autonomy when we did that project. Like if people knew what they were doing, I kind of let them do their thing. And what's funny is when you submitted like the script to me and then showed me like some of the video stuff, I actually intentionally, you, you, you won't know this, but I intentionally didn't give any notes on it. I intentionally didn't try to like say, oh, I would, I would phrase it. Because what I realized was even though I might have told the story very differently, anytime you're narrative building, you're coming from your own thoughts on it and your own perspective and what, you, what narrative you're trying to connect it to, like what archetypal aspect, you know. And one thing I knew is this is how I knew you were a fan because... If people go and watch these now, there's two things. One, I didn't want to have like a credit to this because you did it all. You did the whole thing. You scripted the whole thing. You researched the whole thing. You wrote it all out yourself and then you just submitted it like, you know, for approval or is there any feedback or whatever. And and then secondly, I also thought actually you just did a really good job and I don't want people to be like, oh, maybe throwing like research. I didn't do anything. I didn't do a single thing. So people go and look now on YouTube, I don't know, the Flashpoint channel or whatever it's called now. If they go and watch those, you did those 100% yourself. You, that was just you made those. Yeah, I think that was um, something that like Flashpoint offered and kind of why the whole, like I was saying earlier when I was doing the face it on air stuff, but most of my time was taken off by the off air stuff and doing the research. And, you know, if there was an idea, um, you know, as long as you could do it for relatively cheap and with the equipment we already had, it was like, well, why not? It's content. It's what it's what people want. And coming from kind of a fan's perspective, um, which, you know, I still have, but previously was, uh, that that was all I was, I was just a viewer. Um, kind of knowing in a way what people might want a bit more detailed history of. And then on top of that, I now have access to these players, um, particularly with Flashpoint, because we were kind of in that bubble environment um, and we had, uh, you know, a bit more, um, not like super strict agreements with the teams but i think they were quite up for being involved in content because the players weren't really doing anything else right there was no traveling involved it was most people from from their homes um yeah that was uh i, I totally forgotten that happened i remember like doing quite a lot of the cutting and editing initially myself because most of the editors were just you know uh, strung up with other things sure. um which was an interesting experience from traditionally coming from a script writing perspective was okay I think this works in terms of wording but how does an edit actually fit together like am I presuming I can just find this footage or where am I gonna like music uh, music's a massive part of of um any kind of video content um so that was just like a cool I mean ev everything was just so it was so open at Flashpoint um which I really loved and I think that's kind of something that like within my role kind of growing um, since then and with sort of all, all the changes in the industry, um, that's something that I feel quite lucky to have somewhat, somewhat been able to keep. In this esports world, it can seem like everyone's against you, but I've always got the Skrilluminati, my Patreon community, riding with me. And it is thanks to the support of the following people, this video and all of them on my channel are made possible. Matt Pugnaccio Rakula, Ahmed Haju, Frisky, Tosh, Jensen Gore, Animosity, Toucan, Tobias Bernasconi. If you've ever watched my videos, you know now I'm going to give a massive shout out to Jerky's Minion, the main man. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? You want teasers? Find out who the upcoming interview guests are. Maybe you want to ask me a question. I tend to answer them at length in my video AMA. Do you want to take part in one of those dinner discussions where we talk about what you're interested in esports? Well, if any of these perks or more appeal to you, put your money where your mouth is. Join the Skulluminati today. Where? In the description box below is a Patreon link.